Welcome back to the news today. This is One on One. Our guest tonight is a Professor Yoshua Teitelbaum, a leading historian and expert on the modern Middle East, specifically Saudi Arabia. He teaches at the Bar Ilan University and Stanford, Stanford University. He is also a consultant to several U.S. and Israeli government agencies. His latest book is titled Saudi Arabia and the New Strategic Landscape. Good evening, Mr. Teitelbaum. Thank you very much Good for evening. coming. Uh, so, uh, can I call you a uh, prophet, uh, title bomb? Because it I, seems I, that everyone is talking right now about the fact that Saudi Arabia maybe is the new ally, big ally in the Middle East. Well, I don't know if I'm a prophet, but uh, what I do uh, do believe is that uh, Saudi Arabia is uh, is changing its course. It's operating as a wants to operate and is trying to operate as an independent country, independent from the United States. Uh, it's it's forging its own path uh, via Iran, via oil prices, and all these other other issues. And um, while it still maintains a very tight relationship with the United States, it is uh, not going to dance to Washington's uh, drummer it's, anymore. Where is the shift uh, coming from? Why is it coming right now? It, it's it's not, you know, it's it's been for many years. It's not just this administration that's responding to. It's responding to previous administrations. They were against the United States going into Iraq because they told the Americans that you will uh, get a, a, a Shiite-ruled state in Iraq. That's what happened in Iraq. They want a more robust policy via nuclear I Iran, as does Israel, as Iran marches towards a nuclear weapon. So they are now trying to figure out um, how they will uh, be st more strongly focused on their own interest, a stronger response to Iran, a stronger response in Syria. They were very disappointed with the United's policy in, policy in Syria. And uh, now, vis-a-vis -vis the recent issue over oil prices, they're forging their own path. You know, it, it seems that it brings me to the conclusion that it seems that uh, the United States is not understanding, like maybe we're always saying, doesn't understand exactly what is happening here in the Middle East, doesn't understand the culture, and instead of uh, taking these allies like uh, Saudi Arabia and like maybe other modern countries, it's deciding not to actually listen to what they have to say and listen to their experience and maybe listen to their origins and actually benefit from them. So Saudi Arabia maybe in one way or another gave up on uh, trying to make the United States understand something? Well, uh, we have to be a bit nuanced here. They are. Um, Linked at, at the at the you know at the uh, umbilical cord with the United States in terms of of defense. Okay, there are contracts, billions of dollars worth of contracts that go ten years, twenty years into the future. But at the same time, they are trying to develop a policy that's independent of that. In, and here we have a, a parallel with Israel. By the way, Israel is a country that is very much linked to the United States in its defense relations. But there are issues where there are going to be disagreements. And Israel has operated on its own and has asserted itself vis-a-vis -vis the United States, and it's sometimes caused some tension. Um, Saudi Arabia is doing the same thing now and trying to forge its uh, its own path. So uh, you connected Israel, and you just mentioned Israel in this. Uh, you know, a lot of us, a lot of the journalists maybe were a little bit uh, skeptic about what Benjamin Netanyahu said after Operation Protective Edge when he talked about new allies in the Middle East, new allies in the modern, like modern uh, uh, countries in the Middle East. And, and we knew that he, in one way or another, is hinting uh, towards uh, Saudi Arabia. What is the connection between these two countries? Because there is a connection that is not on the table, but under the table. There's a connection. Um, but I think Israeli politicians are doing uh, is Israel's uh, disservice by talking about it too much. Okay. okay. So there's definitely connection we see in, in foreign reports, uh, 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 various reports about, about connections, about meetings between intelligence officials. This is all in the newspapers. Um, but I think it, it doesn't serve Israel's interest to talk about it so much. A, a foreign minister, uh, Lieberman, has talked about his meetings with officials. I, I'm not sure if he's still foreign minister. You know, uh, yeah, being, with right, everything okay, that is happening, okay, and we're not anyway, sure about anything that is happening. And so uh, he, uh, he, this is not, a, not useful. These, con these uh, uh, connections, contacts need to be kept 
uh, uh, quiet. There is a common interest, and there are things they can do together, but they need to keep quiet about it. You know, I'm trying to understand what exactly right now uh, is happening in the Middle East with, with what is happening in the region and the extreme jihadism and the, the, the terror uh, groups that are developing inside the Sunni, uh, let's say, sectarian part in Islam. And of course, we know that uh, Saudi Arabia is uh, the biggest, maybe, let's say, chief of staff of uh, the Sunni uh, sector in the in Muslims is in the Muslim religion is this part of this uh, maybe shift that is happening for for several years now is this coming as part of trying to fight this extreme Sunni um, jihadism that is uh, maybe trying to control the, the Muslim world Saudi Arabia is has difficulty right now okay Saudi Arabia sees itself as the the leader of the Sunni world in Arabic we say marja marja like the, the uh, source of emulation of of the sunni world and the sunni world feels threatened by the shiite world in in hezbollah in iraq uh, and and iran they feel threatened so it wants to stand behind the sunnis on the other hand it doesn't want sunni extremism even though a lot of that comes from within saudi arabia and saudi history which was quite extreme wahhabism was quite extreme but this is a uh, kind of an ideology that has gotten out of control. So they're trying as much as they can to rein it in, and they're trying to encourage moderates. But the problem is the moderates aren't fighting. And if you want to, and, and if you want to uh, crush uh, Shiites and the Shiite expansion, then you need the people who are going to do the job on the ground. Unfortunately, those are mostly the very fanatic people. So uh, how are they going to fight this? Because part of uh, what we're seeing right now, this reconciliation between, or maybe we should put it like uh, in an under, like uh, not say reconciliation exactly, but to say that the, the, this uh, new arrangement between Cairo and, and Qatar, where does it put Saudi Arabia in the equation? So this is a, um, a very uh, new development, and I don't know how long it's going to continue. Saudi Arabia and, and Kuwait and the UAE are trying to, uh, to bring uh, Cairo and Doha uh, back together um, uh, because everyone wants this to calm down. Everyone, I think, is more realizing that, that the current regime, undemocratic or whatever, in, in, uh, in Cairo is the best for now. Everyone in the region, except for Qatar, I'll speak to that in a moment, is scared of the Muslim Brotherhood. Okay, So they're trying, the Gulf countries who like to operate together in the GCC are trying to get Qatar to calm down, to stop inciting, to stop having uh, Al Jazeera broadcast what it broadcasts, to stop giving shelter to Sheikh Karadawi and, and, and so forth. And they're agreed to make some of these steps. But um, we'll see if they really follow through. And, and the fight, if as in, we yeah. are continuing in this fight that you're saying, yeah. that by, let's say, blocking Al Jazeera, blocking a lot of the things that are happening right now in Syria and sector and sector, how they are planning with this uh, new approach to block Iran? With the, let's say, one of the moves were uh, dropping the, the oil prices? That's it. Um, the first thing is oil prices. Okay, this is affecting Iran. It's affecting um, it's affecting Russia, which is supporting Assad, which Saudi Arabia isn't in favor of. Saudi Arabia is not in favor of Iran. Saudi Arabia sees the United States now as an oil competitor. Okay, and but to produce American oil is very expensive. Okay, so by uh, let's say not. Trying, not raising the price by not uh, by 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 um, its current policy, uh, which is keeping the price low, they are damaging the U.S. oil industry, and uh, they're doing that on purpose because they want to maintain their their market share. So, so you're saying that uh, if they are trying to do something good, they might, um, in one way or another, hurt their relationship, important relationship with the United States. I don't think it'll hurt the relationship with the United States. I think it's a wake-up call for the United States. Uh, the United States uh, needs to listen, as I think as you said earlier, more closely to what its allies in the region are saying. This is a strong signal to the United States that, uh, I mean, it has to do with oil, but, but Saudi Arabia is saying to Washington, look at Iran, look at Iran. This is what really concerns us. And we can, you know, hurt you in your pocketbook. They, they, have, they can breathe for a long time at current um, oil prices. Saudi Arabia has 750 billion dollars in reserves. 
okay? So they can live with this, people say two years, three years, without a higher oil price. But the American oil industry can't. Uh, Joshua Teitelbaum, Professor Joshua Teitelbaum, thank you very much for this very, very interesting uh, conversation. And uh, thank you, our viewers, for being with us tonight. Tomorrow we'll be here at the same time, same place from the Jaffa Board. Israel, have peace, have a great night.